Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and thanks for joining us at You've Got the Power. Uh, today, we've got an interesting topic on ALR ligament laxity and CCI type 2B, basically rotational C1C2 problems and side bending C1C2 problems. Now, we've got a little bit of a windstorm here in Colorado, so if you hear some crazy sounds in the background, that's probably what that is. I live sort of close to the canyons and some every once in a while wind comes ripping through there at like 80, 90 mile an hour gusts. And this is an old house, so it, it kind of makes some strange noises. So anyway, we'll get into that. Uh, as I've discussed in the past, uh, we'll do that and then we'll do some questions. Uh, questions can be about that topic or really anything at all. So again, just to announce it uh, a second time, we're going to get into ALR ligament laxity, type 2B, craniocervical instability, or CCI. And that's going to be C1C2 rotation and side bending issues. So let me go ahead and start off, share my screen first here. And then I'll start that presentation and we'll get going. And we'll grab a pen down here. So ALR ligament laxity and rotational instability type 2B CCI. So these are the references for today. Now we've talked in the past about different types of CCI, type one, type two, type three. Type 1 involves C0, C1, uh, or up in here between the skull and the atlas. Type 2 involves C1, C2, or down in there. And type 3 involves C2, 3. And then there are different types, A, B, C, D, A, B, A, B, C, etc. So the type we're talking about today is type 2, uh, B. So it's C1, C2 rotation. Uh, and side bending problems. So let's go a little bit into C1C2 anatomy to try to better understand what's going on here. So C1C2 is the level that's responsible for 50% of your neck rotation. So as shown above, the atlas uh, goes around the dens with head rotation. Now this is the most mobile joint in the spine. It's got the biggest range of motion at about 45 degrees to the right, 45 degrees to the left that just happen at C1, C2. And it's that ring of the atlas here going around the peg of the dens that allows that to occur. Now, the C1C2 is a special joint, and as far as I know, it's the only biconcave joint in the body, meaning it's got one concave surface here on top of another concave surface. And it seems to be that way in order to allow that much rotation. So it allows the C1 to slide a little bit down uh, on the C2 or a little bit back on the C2 uh, to allow that motion to happen. So that there's not only rotation that's happening here, but a little bit of shifting forward as well. And as you might imagine, if we have the normal biconcave joint like this one, it's pretty stable, right? It, one's gonna hold the other in place. But a convex convex joint, if the ligaments don't support it, can be very unstable, whereas one joint surface can, can sort of go down the side of the other. And in that case here at C1C2, that would lead to rotation. So there's two things that stabilize the C1C2 joint. We've got ligaments and muscles. Now, there's lots of different ligaments to talk about in this area. And in fact, I'm going to focus today just on the ALAR ligament. So 
If your skull is up here, the alar ligaments are over here and over here. They go from that dens of C2 and they go up like this, reaching for the skull and hold on to it. Now the alar ligaments also stabilize rotation. So when you turn your head, they kind of wind around the dens, causing some uh, resistance to motion. And it's that resistance to motion, which is timed with the muscles, that cause C1 and C2 to stay in one spot on that biconcave joint. Now, if, this, if these ligaments get too loose, Again, one joint surface is going to go down. The other, I'm going to get a lot more rotation than we bargained for at C1, C2. And this is what that looks like here. You can see these are the alar ligaments. And then when we rotate the model, so when we rotate C1 going that way, Uh, so apparently there's an issue seeing the slide. I don't know why that would be. Uh, let me get, let me stop the sharing here. And see what the issues are. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to restart that because apparently some people couldn't see the slides. So let's try that again. And this hopefully works this time. So I'm just going to start over from the beginning. And hold on a second, let me get rid of everything. Uh, let's see here, cord. Well, maybe it didn't save any. No. Doesn't look like it thinks it saved anything. Anyway, we'll start over from the beginning. Hopefully everyone can see this now. So alar ligament laxity and rotational instability type 2B CCI. So these are the references. So we have here, and let me uh, start over here. Hold on a second here. I would like to get rid of all of this. Okay, I think we're ready now. Uh, ALR ligament laxity and rotational instability type 2B CCI. So these are the uh, references here. And as we talked about uh, before, we've got uh, type 1 CCI, which has to do with the 0, 1 level, type 2, which has to do with the C1, C2 level, and then type 3, which has to do with C2, 3, and then there are different subtypes within each one of those. C1, C2 anatomy. So the C1, C2 level is responsible for about 50% of your neck rotation as shown above. Uh, the atlas C1 goes around the dens with head rotation. And uh, that happens because you've got a ring of the atlas going around the peg of the dens. For C1 and C2, that's a biconcave joint. 
uh, and that's going to be an inherently unstable joint. It's the only biconcave joint I know of in the body. And that allows one to ride down the other just a little bit with head rotation. The big problem is when you use when you lose ligamentous stability is that a convex concave joint is going to be more inherently stable. But this biconcave joint is going to be inherently unstable where one surface goes dramatically down the other and that's going to cause C1, C2 rotation. Stability of the C1-C2 joint is the ligaments and the muscles. Uh, so it takes both of those to have a stable C1-C2 or really any joint in the body. Alar ligaments are these guys. So they go from uh, the dens up to the skull and they allow C2 to form a tight connection with the skull. And as your head turns around, the alar ligaments tend to wind up just a little bit around that dens, causing some resistance to rotation. So as you can see here, these are the alar ligaments here and here. And these are the alar ligaments slightly winding up around the dens, causing some resistance to C1, C2 rotation. And so basically what we have is this increasing tension from the alar ligament as it winds up around the joint to help keep that biconvex C1, C2 joint uh, aligned. And that's important because if it gets unaligned, meaning if this one starts to go that way and comes down the hill here, then we're gonna get into a situation where we have rotational instability. There are also lots of muscles to talk about here, rectus capitis posterior minor, uh, this one, rectus capitis posterior major, uh, the obliques, uh, etc. So lots of different muscles whose job it is to hold the head on top of the neck. Now we will frequently see these muscles in this area start to atrophy when there's a problem in the upper cervical spine, especially in this area. So type 2B, what we're talking about today, the C1, C2 rotational and lateral instability is either when we see this type of overhang here where the C1 goes that way over the C2 at more than three to four millimeters. And that's due to a lax alar ligament or when we see excessive rotational instability on something like a rotational CT scan of more than 56 degrees. So those are two ways we can use radiographs or x-rays and CT scans to look at this. Now this one is usually a digital motion x-ray and the other one would usually be a rotational CT scan. Now, rotational CT scan, in my experience, is, is a little bit less sensitive at finding this than DMX. So again, uh, diagnosis method one is that DMX side bending. That's the open mouth lateral bending view. This is what it looks like in real life. Uh, and if there's three millimeters of C1-C2 overhang, then there's about a two thirds chance this is abnormal finding or one standard deviation from the mean. If there's four millimeters C1, C2 overhang, then it's two standard deviations from the mean or 95% chance uh, that it's an abnormal finding. And that's based on the paper there. As I've always said, you know, this actually now has better uh, face validity than uh, many of the neurosurgical measurements that are used that haven't undergone this type of analysis to determine uh, what's the likelihood of an abnormal finding or something that's called abnormal really just being normal. And then the diagnosis method number two is rotational CT. So this is how it's done here basically measuring the angle of C1. So this is the C1 angle um, and then the angle of C2. 
and then subtracting out C1 from C2 uh, to get a number. Now, if that number is more than 56 degrees, uh, that's a problem. Now, realize in this CT scan, they're rotating the head and they're usually taping the head in that position. So it's not a real comfortable test to get done. In addition, a CT scan uses about uh, 50 times more x-ray than a DMX. Um, so a lot more x-ray exposure in this one. So really only two ligaments have been studied to date for their contributions to rotational instability at C1, C2. Um, one is the ALAR ligament, which controls most of it. And the other is the C1, C2 facet capsules, which uh, is certainly a player, but a minor player, meaning that the ALAR overwhelms the C1, C2 facet capsule ability to control rotation. So we have a lot of patients out there that are told that you can treat the facet capsules and that's all you need. Not really true because the ALR ligament actually provides more stability than the C1-C2 facet capsules can provide. It's a much bigger, stouter ligament. Uh, and hence, we're really not in a situation where most patients are going to respond with this kind of issue if you just try to tighten down the C1-C2 facet capsules because those can't substitute for the ALAR ligament. Injections, uh, so then the injection targets are gonna be the ALAR, the C1-C2 facet joint, and uh, C1-C2 facet capsules. Now, there are other things that many times have to be injected in these patients because they've got other issues, different types of instability, other things being irritated, but that's sort of the basic uh, rung of what most people need. And so what kind of injection would you need? Uh, we're talking about this PICL over here. And as far as the C1, C2 facet injections go, it would be sort of at this level. And the same thing with the facet capsular injections to make sure you're actually in the facet capsule and don't, you know, not just convincing yourself you're in the facet capsule, you would need that level, which is going to be C-arm fluoroscopy, uh, highly, highly trained um, interventional spine person doing something like PRP. And then to get the ALAR ligament, you're going to need this level, which would be that PICL. So in conclusion, C1, C2 rotational instability is a type of CCI. The same ligaments also allow too much lateral bending of C1, C2, or what we call overhang. The ligament that controls this motion uh, is the ALR primarily, secondary facet capsular ligaments. Uh, and there may be others that have yet to be studied, meaning that, you know, all we have are these two studies done by Dvorak et al. So it's not like 20 different uh, researchers have studied this to date. Uh, the treatment is either fusion or injection-based therapy. Injections are the highly advanced type PICL, C1, C2, uh, facet injections, and capsular ligaments. So let me go to questions now. Apologize for delaying getting those slides up. I think we must have had an issue within, uh, within StreamYard. But let me go to the original questions here. So Rachel Riggs. Uh, I think, think this is my problem, but no one has told me definitively. You may have, you have my DMX on file. Is something you can help to find for me. Um, sure, Rachel. If we have done a telemedicine, uh, then we can certainly tell you what that number is. Uh, and I was traveling over the weekend. I think you sent me an email about that, so I'll try to get to that. Let's see. Do, 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 do. It's been advanced uh, by Stacy Kaufman. I have a C6 avulsion, which undetermined amount of ligament attachment, C6 threshold thesis, rotating C7, PLL and AL. Do you recommend CBP for an XPSL or only after? Um, certainly, CBP is a good thing to try. Um, we haven't been all that successful with CCI patients being able, or most CCI patients being able to tolerate it. Uh, but if you can tolerate it, then it's definitely something you should do both before, during, and after. 
Let's see. Yeah, we got the screen. Andy, for the laser tracking exercises, I'm confused on how this will fix the atrophy in the subcuspidal muscles. I thought muscles only grow by progressive or progressive must be load. This only works uh, proprioception. No, it's just the beginning of the process. So you got to realize that these muscles are usually atrophied to the level of um, 80 percent, 90 percent in many patients. So what that means is that if you are uh, out there and uh, let's say we you break your leg and I put your leg in a cast and it comes out of that cast and your uh, quad muscle has shrunken up by 80 percent. Now, if your quad muscle has shrunken up by 80 percent, you're not going to be able to walk. So the first prescription is going to be try to walk around the block. And when you can walk around the block five or six times, then we'll get you to start working in the gym. Uh, and then once you're done with the gym, hopefully after a year, we can get it back where it needs to be. So most patients are in that place where their quad muscle, meaning these muscles, I'm, I'm using the quad muscle here uh, as a demonstration, has shrunken up by about 80%. Hence, uh, they need a lot less to begin with. And then once they tolerate a lot less, they can do more to get the strength back. And in the same way that you would be told to walk around the block to see if you could get that muscle to contract again, because 80% would be very, very severe. Um, e -er, uh, is it possible to heal severe cranial cervical and lower cervical instability with vitamin C and gelatin in huge doses? Uh, probably not possible to heal them that way. Uh, John, in terms of using PRP for acute versus chronic injuries, would you say that an acute ligament tear, extremely minor, has a higher chance of responding versus a chronic ligament laxity problem? Um, yeah, more has to do with the size of the tear. So if we're talking about a very small tear in a ligament, then uh, dextrose prolotherapy or PRP work well. If we're talking about bigger tears in ligaments, then that's more bone marrow concentrate. Uh, Marty, I've had CCI since my vaccine. No one can help me. In SoCal, I've tried everything. Yeah, Marty, I, I don't think that the vaccine is a cause of CCI. Uh, it certainly may have brought out an existing CCI problem, meaning that when you get, uh, if you're talking about the COVID vaccine, uh, when you get the COVID vaccine, every part of your body that has ever been a problem that doesn't usually bother you on a day-to-day -day basis feels like it does uh, or feels like it's a big issue. Now, for most people, that's just a short-term inflammation. Obviously, um, in a very small percentage of the population, that can end up in some chronic inflammation. Um, so it probably just pointed to an issue that was already there. Uh, Ulysses, how was the Regenics Conference? What did you talk, what did you talk about over there? You know, Ulysses, I blogged about that today on my blog, so that's a good one to read. Uh, basically, you know, we talked about um, all the business parts of Regenix, but uh, on, the, on the network, and then we talked about lots of clinical things. So we've got a whole afternoon devoted to clinical case sharing and uh, education of each other. Uh, we're seeing increasing a tunnel of decree. Okay, got that. Yeah, got that all fixed. Jim, for EDS patients, would it be more effective to use sclerosing agents that produce scar tissue on ligaments versus using dextrose and PRP that can produce usual faulty stretch collagen? You know, Jim, based on what I've seen with most hypermobile EDS patients is they do better with uh, dextrose prolotherapy or bone marrow concentrate. They don't seem to do uh, quite as well on ligaments when it comes to PRP. Now, their joints still respond to PRP, um, but their ligaments, not so much. So um, I wouldn't really want to use uh, a sclerosing agent because you don't really want scar tissue. You want uh, thicker tissue. 
And if you've got scar tissue that stays disorganized, then that's not going to be uh, tissue that's very strong. Lissy, do you treat patients with hip impingement and mild arthritis, cam and pincer? We, we do. Uh, Robert, with ALR damage, if a rotation study is performed and they deem it normal, but one has lateral overlap, is it still an ALR issue? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by lateral overlap. If what you mean is C1, C2 overhang, uh, then that's a more sensitive way to look for ALR ligament damage in my clinical experience than, C1, than a C1, C2 rotation study. Uh, Wendy, have you ever worked on a patient with a congenital complete absence of C1 posterior vertebrae? I'm having a hard time finding any help and I'm miserable. I can deal laying down, but whenever I stand, my symptoms go crazy. Seven MRIs, two CAT scans, MRI and four sets of x-rays, but no answers. Um, yeah, Wendy, a lot of that has to do with whether the ligaments that we're talking about are still intact, ALAR, transverse, and other ligaments. So, you know, the first thing would be that without a, a posterior arch of C1, you probably wouldn't have many of those same ligaments like posterior lenoocipital membrane and things like your nuchal ligament and your rectus capitis posterior minor would be, would have different biomechanical stresses than someone who had uh, the back part of the atlas present. Now, when it comes to doing a simple upper cervical MRI, and that's a head coil uh, focused on the upper cervical ligaments, that's probably the next step to make sure that you have them. Uh, most of the patients with a, the lack of a posterior arch do have those ligaments, um, but obviously they can get stretched. So that's the first step. And then the second step would be that digital motion X-ray but the first step is just trying to make sure the ligaments uh, that are supposed to be there that that control what we're talking about today are there. Listen, my MRI shows that I hip cam deformity with mild arthritis. So I decided to get a PRP for it. Uh, and my low back, the doctor who did it was rude. And after the procedure, I felt nothing like didn't work. Hey, Ulysses, as I've talked about many times on this channel, PRP is not PRP, meaning that you know, what doctors call PRP is quite different. So I don't know, did he give you a high dose enough PRP? And we've also talked about the ability to inject it in specific spots. So did you need it injected around the S1 nerve and he wasn't able to do that? Did he do simple prolotherapy in your low back and SI joints? Um, did you have a facet joint that was causing hip pain? but he didn't have the qualifications to inject the facet joint. Um, high dose PRP, low dose PRP, leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor. So very hard to, to look at what someone else did when I, I don't know the quality of what it is they did. Uh, Regenix been advanced by Sherry Kopp. Does the PICL treat all the different types? You do need some surgery. Uh, when it comes to different types of CCI, Sherry, you may want to go back and read or watch that uh, particular uh, video I did because it, it sort of explains with each one of those what needs to be injected. So only some of those, about half of them need the PICL, the other half of them uh, don't. Uh, none of them need surgery out of the gate unless there's uh, some big, big problem that goes beyond usually the scope of what we're talking about here today. Uh, Oleg, I have muscle twitching all over the body at random uh, times, areas, onset January 2021, when my neck issues got worse, HEDS patient, neuro workup clean, some impingement on, on the EMG. I'm sure the ones in arms, head, face are probably related to CCI, but could the other ones be too? At first, I even mostly had in feet, legs, seemed to twitch most, but random parts like the bottom of the pelvic region, side of glute, etc. But well, Oleg, the first thing to make sure of is that's not some bad neurologic stuff, and that would be things like ALS. It sounds like they ruled that out. The next step would be to rule out that there's not a big herniated disc in the neck or the low back that could be causing that. And then assuming all of that's ruled out, and if there is significant CCI, then the thought would be that that's being caused by CCI. 
Onset seems to correlate with neck flare-ups. Also, strangely, seem to get twitching from exertion at most of the muscles. Even something like moderate work, working out, walking for a while, lifting and carrying stuff, gripping something strongly for a bit, like I have almost none. But then I'll go for a hike or try to go to the gym for elliptical light weights. And we'll get a bunch of twitching, sometimes for a couple of days, if actually more of a workout. Yeah, so Oleg, twitching is normally a sign of denervation or irritation of the nerves. Um, so again, first thing to rule out is the bad neurologic diseases. Sounds like that was done. Second thing would be a herniated or bulging disc in the neck or low back causing central canal stenosis. And then assuming none of that's there, if there is substantial craniocervical instability, that would be the most likely cause. Oleg, for general anti-inflammatory benefits, should I take the Regenix Omega-3 and turmeric in addition to stem cell support formula, or does it already have enough of those two? Um, I don't think you need to take any additional, no. Rachel, overall, which ligament is more critical to stability, the ALAR or the transverse? Um, just different kinds of stability. So when it comes to the... Uh, Transverse ligament, that's going to be the stability of the dens against the atlas. When it comes to the alar ligament, that's going to be rotational or side bending stability. So it really depends on which ligament is involved. Ulysses, yes, the doctor did use x ray guidance with a long needle into my butt. I had to pay $500 for it too. I felt like it was a waste of money for nothing. Um, yeah, so then we get into. Um, what was injected in the hip. Uh, so for instance, to inject the labrum, if it was a labral hip problem, then that would take ultrasound. If it was intraarticular, then you could do it with ultrasound or x-ray guidance. And then we get into what kind of PRP was this? High dose, low dose, leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor. Just because you paid 500 bucks doesn't, doesn't mean you got good stuff. <laughs> there is no relationship in this area between how much you pay and what you get. Only research helps that one. John, would an EMG nerve conduction study be useful for me in a consultation? Um, listen, I always tell patients I, I would I'll always take more information rather than less. Usually it won't be that helpful, um, but, but if I get the opportunity to get more information, I'll, I'll, I'll always take it. Rachel, may I get Dr. Stone's email address, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Rachel, I can give you Carla's and then I'll put mine as well. So Carla is my assistant. So I'm putting that here. And again, as I always uh, say, critical that if you're interested in doing a telemedicine workup that you not go through the uh, Schultz or the Regenix call centers, but go directly to Carla, her email address I put down there. Um, and then my email address that goes to my desk, I'll also put here. Okay, and that's the email that goes to my desk. Bethany, how do I understand if my swollen burst is between C0 and C1, uh, would that indicate that I have type 1 CCI? Not necessarily. Um, it could be... Uh, Type 2 as well. Uh, Debbie, any experience on EDS patients, CCI, intracranial hypertension, and carry malformation 1 being helped by PICL? Yeah, that would probably be most of the Chiari patients. I'm sorry, the EDS patients we have. So, yes, uh, in general, in my opinion, they take more time to recover and they take more time to show a response, usually two to four procedures but uh, ultimately more do well than not. Uh, Rosalind, uh, is there a UK clinic that apparently works with Genix? Is, is it like yours with regard to getting injections for the set joints above C2? For example, they use the same PRP technique as you. So, um, so as far as I understand, the Regenix UK clinic doesn't do 0, 1, and 1, 2 anymore. Um, and uh, Colorado is the only site for that. And then when it comes to the PICL procedure that we're talking about here, that's not done in Europe at all. 
Um, so that would be a Colorado only thing. Uh, they do use the same kind of PRP that we use. Uh, Kimmy, upright MRI says poster ring of C1 in close approximation to the dens of C2. Does this uh, likely mean C1 is sliding too far forward or, sl or C2 sliding too far back? Um, really neither. That would tend to be seen more often in a type 1B instability where you're getting um, too much extension of the skull on the atlas. And uh, that's being caused by uh, ligaments that are deep in here between the atlas and the skull being damaged. Uh, now, that's not always a cause of that, but uh, it's one of the things we would look for when we see that atlas hitting the back of the skull in extension. Uh, Jim, do you think it's likely for a moderately lax ligament to heal with one PRP treatment? Have you seen it before? It'd likely be two or three treatments. You know, Jim, I need to know what, what it is we're talking about. So um, hard to tell. Stacy, is it possible for injections to correct retrolisthesis of C6? Um, yes, in general, but not if it's a fixed retrolisthesis, meaning if you've got uh, degenerative disc disease with changes in shape of the bone, then that's not going to correct. If you've got a retrolisthesis where, where one goes back on the other with extension uh, and then it gets better in flexion, that will correct. Debbie, is neck physical therapy offered at your clinic? Uh, it is. Robert, regarding CXA live, I didn't catch, oh, the, the Facebook live on CXA, I didn't catch if there's a mechanism to increase the degrees of a chiro type maneuver. Um, the issue really in most people isn't increasing the degrees of the CXA. The, the problem is with flexion, the CXA gets too low, or that means the skull rotates forward too much, which puts undue stretch on the spinal cord and medulla. Um, but for the vast majority of patients who have that kind of instability, which would be a type 1A, uh, in neutral, they're not bad. It's it's when they go down into flexion that all hell breaks loose. So that's the goal is to prevent the collapse of that CXA with flexion. Uh, Wendy, uh, Debbie, oh, it's to somebody else. Uh, Rosalind, as well as C0, C1, and C2 instability, I've busted my C5, 6 disc. Includes pulposis is gone. It's almost bone on bone after failed laser surgery. Can PRP or stem cells do anything for that? No, regrettably, that ship has sailed. So there's no way to regrow you a new C5-6 disc. Uh, now, we can mitigate or control the symptoms uh, related to that C5-6 disc, however. Uh, Kimmy, upright MRI also says the myodura bridge is gone and only the dura matter is remaining. Is that something I need to focus on? Uh, muscles or the ligaments to heal posterior? Uh, would this have anything to do with hyperextension of C1 or consistent malrotation of C2? Um, yeah, you really can't tell from an upright MRI whether the myodural bridge is present or not. Um, the reason is that all upright MRIs are very low resolution by their very nature. And the slice thickness is far too high for us to see that. Um, now, if there was a real question as to where the myodural bridge itself was gone, then we could do a three Tesla uh, supine MRI with a head coil and ask for thin slices, i.e. one millimeter slices through that area and try to see if it's present or not. But I wouldn't trust any upright MRI to diagnose that the myodural bridge is is completely gone. Now, what they may mean is it's not functioning well, meaning the myodural bridge, uh, the job there with the rectus capitis posterior minor muscle is to prevent, I guess I gotta go this way, prevent the infolding of the uh, dura with extension. And if it's not pulling the, the dura out of the way, you tend to see kinking of the dura with extension. That could be related to problems between the skull and the atlas and extension as well. Uh, Marty Smith Van Su, 
I can't hold my head up. I now have tachycardia and diagnosed swallowing issues, sensitivity light, hot, cold, prone to falling. All this came to head 24 hours after my second vaccine. Um, yeah, but that wouldn't be related. There, there's no mechanism for the vaccine to harm your ligaments at this point, meaning we have no uh, research connection between those two things, and, and it would be hard to come up with a mechanism of action that would allow that to happen. So that's probably a completely different set of issues than having to do with craniocervical instability as the primary cause 24 hours after a vaccine, meaning there's no, no possible mechanism for that to occur. Um, and there's no mechanism that I could even postulate where it would occur. Now, there may have been other things that could have happened with the vaccine, um, but that wouldn't be one of them. Uh, Debbie, uh, Wendy and I, oh, we got that. That's for somebody else. Carrie, if your sequence to do overhang is abnormal on the right, but not on the left, which ALR ligament is the one causing that laxity, came in a bit late, so it's hard for you already answered. Yeah, so it's generally the uh, ALAR ligament on the side of the overhang that's causing the problem. Now, that's different if we're talking about rotation. That's the op generally the opposite ALAR ligament. But when it comes to this type of side bending, usually it's the same side. And when I say usually, what I mean is that there's other things that can happen too, meaning that if the movement is associated between the skull and, and the atlas, that can change that game. But assuming the skull and the atlas motion is normal, then it's the same side ALAR ligament as the side bend. Ulysses, which bone makes the head move around again? Uh, that would be C1 uh, rotating on the dens of C2. Uh, yeah, that's the, the uh, link I talked about before, Ulysses, to the blog on the Regenics National Conference. ZA, if the vertebral artery or another vital structure were to be hit during posterior treatment, would it always cause a sudden reaction? Is there ever any delay with something like that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So let's talk about that for a second. And let me let me think about it with you. So if if you inject it into the vertebral artery directly, then uh, that could cause a brainstem stroke or some brainstem or cerebellar uh, injury. Now, it depends on what you injected. You might not get immediate symptoms because uh, it, it might require uh, actual axonal death and dieback, meaning weeks later, before you started to get symptoms. But that would depend on what it is you injected into the artery. Uh, so either immediate or weeks later. Now, if you injured the artery and you damaged the wall, um, it's theoretically possible to later get a, uh, a vertebral dissection where a portion balloons out. So again, that could be immediate or, or later. Ravati, how successful is stem cell therapy for hip labral tear? Uh, usually pretty successful. Depends a lot on the tear, however. Uh, Ulysses, there's evidence that shows that a bone spur could cause, could be the reason why hip impingement forms. Ulysses, I think you have it backwards. Usually it's uh, the hip impingement and then a bone spur uh, grows to try to stabilize the hip. Sharon, uh, I understand the CCI get worse over time if you don't have another injury. Um, yeah, Sharon, as always say, you know, and for most patients who go to that chronic phase, uh, after a while, these problems can get baked in. So for about half of them that we see that have had this for a long time, uh, things are still plastic and their symptoms can go away if they're stabilized. The other half, the symptoms and the neural damage start to get baked in. So that's one of the reasons to try to get treated as soon as you can if you've got actual CCI causing symptoms. Uh, Ulysses, 
Uh, I feel like prolotherapy and bone marrow give people much more pain relief than PRP. Um, if you have EDS, yes, generally uh, for everyone else, it's bone marrow. Well, it depends on what we're treating, but let's say we're talking about ligaments, bone marrow greater than PRP, greater than prolo. Uh, Roslyn, the posterior atlantoaccipital membrane or PAOM and atlantoaxial ligament, uh, can they become a lax? And if so, do they respond to PRP? Um, they can become lax um, and they can uh, respond to PRP. Now, both of those are uh, advanced injections. So you're not going to get either one of those injected at the average prolo place uh, using ultrasound or blind or that just turns on the fluoro machine and doesn't use contrast. So those are going to be level four injections to get those done safely. Um, Eric, what's the difference between horizontal and rotational instability? So here, the horizontal instability we're talking about is with side bending and rotational is C1, C2. Um, they're caused by the same thing, which is going to be that, that ALR ligament laxity. And then this is just Carla's email address, as I've said before. If you're interested in doing a telemedicine, best to reach out to Carla. Don't go fill out something online at Regenix or at Centeno Schultz. Don't call or send them an email. Best thing to do is to contact Carla directly. Sharon, do you see any difference in patients between CCI from RA versus CCI from EDS and injury? A uh, big difference in CCI from RA. By the time uh, CCI happens in RA patients, or rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, there's a, a big destruction of lots of structures uh, up there of the joints and usually uh, very serious destruction of the ligaments at the same time. Uh, Wendy, going back to my question about absence of the, of the posterior vertebrae when you set up your cervical MRI with coil, I've had three of those. Did you mean an upright MRI? Um, so Wendy, um, yeah, upright MRI is not going to have the detail necessary to show me what I'm looking for. Uh, and if you, what you would need is an upper cervical focused MRI. It's not a cervical MRI, not a brain MRI, but one that is focused on the upper cervical spine, but uses a head coil, which looks like a helmet. Uh, in order to get the MRI. So on the one to you it would look like a brain MRI, but the, but the slices that we're going after and the things that we're looking at are in the upper neck and not the brain. Uh, usually it's better to have a three Tesla unit or a 1.5 Tesla unit. Um, and then yes, we do consultations via telemedicine. Best way to do that is uh, again, to reach out to Carla, my assistant. Sure, John. Stacy, what's the best diagnostic test to see measure ligament detachment? Uh, if you're talking about the anterior longitudinal ligament, um, you know, to, just would be a routine cervical MRI. If there's some question of a small area of ligament detachment, then it would need to be uh, thin slices through that area. So usually one millimeter slices through the midline is what you'd be looking for. Um, and you could probably see it well on either a uh, T2 weighted image or a proton, proton density image. Uh, Regenix, I'm advanced by Harry Winston. This sounds like my specific type CCI does the amount of time you've been dealing with it when you do a success rate. You know, Harry, it, it does, uh, or at least the number of treatments required. So uh, for patients that have been dealing with this for a year or less, it's usually a one and done. For patients that have been dealing with this for years or more, we're talking usually about two to four treatments. Lissy, some doctors really thinks it's okay to scan people over nonsense, especially in regeneration medicine. Um, not quite. Yeah. I mean, as, as I was writing my blog, there's lots of that going on. Oleg, sitting at a computer is by far a huge trigger for my neck symptoms, aches, cracks, neuropressure pulling, 
driving probably second, seemingly anything where I'm static, perhaps hands out in front contribute too, especially vision focused on something. Actually sitting and talking to people or eating is nowhere as bad and walking by far the best. Uh, could you explain this in the context of spinal issues, uh, HEDS? Um, yeah, so basically, um, I would want to see uh, if you've got a lot of kyphosis. So if you've got a lot of kyphosis, which is forward head, that would make sitting worse for all of these things. Uh, so that's one thing to look at. Uh, Oleg, strangely, sitting feels better if sideways leg up, weird body positions, but still aggravates neck. Laying back in a recliner on a wedge used to be way better, but strangely not as much now. If I try to use those to read or watch TV, I still get neck symptoms and sometimes even laying flat on the floor. But it all feels better if I put hands behind head and use and went back under cheek on one side. How does this work with CCI related issues? People. Um, not sure I can analyze all of that as to which ligaments are an issue. Certainly, many patients feel like if they stabilize their head, on their neck, things feel better. Uh, Finn, is dextrose ever more effective than PRP, for example, in types of EDS? Yeah, Finn, as I was saying, I, in my clinical experience, dextrose prolotherapy works well in EDS, as does bone marrow concentrate, usually bone marrow concentrate more so than dextrose prolotherapy. Uh, many uh, EDS patients, for their ligaments don't really respond all that well to PRP uh, alone, but their joints respond well. So that's been my experience. Rhonda, uh, how to time NUCA car adjustments visits before PICL and after NUCA adjustments briefly help my body be in better alignment. Neck will feel like something is trying to get in good place, but just can't increase in tension. Yeah, Rhonda, we generally recommend NUCA uh, adjustments or AO adjustments, either one, uh, before, uh, during, and after. And what I mean by that is not during the procedure itself, but during that immediate post-procedure time. Uh, for instance, we have patients that the next day will get a new adjustment uh, to put themselves back in place at that next day after the procedure. And they do that before and after. Finn, can prolotherapy, PRP, of Siemens do for set joint alone, fix a minor four degree C2 rotation does and so he's going to be prepared with some sort of chiropractic solution. I would need to know what's causing that. Um, so today we've been talking about type 2B rotational issues caused by a lax alar ligament. Um, in that case, you would need the PICL procedure to treat the alar ligament. The posterior prolotherapy isn't going to do squat for you. Um, but there may be other things causing that rotation. So for instance, scoliosis can, or a side bend in the spine can cause that, for example. Uh, Liam, hi, Dr. C, does the healing timeline differ for different structures injected during PICL? Do facet joint injections respond quicker than ALAR injections? Um, not necessarily. You know, generally for PICL, if we're talking about the internal ligaments, ALAR transverse, we don't even look till about three months to see where someone is. Now, if we're talking about posterior injections where we're only doing the facet joints and ligaments, then really four to six weeks is when we would look to see if there's a, a good uh, outcome. Stable on three. If C1 stew overhang is an indicator of measurement for ALR laxity, is there a similar movement that would indicate transverse laxity on a DMX? Yeah, generally it's opening of the atlantodental inner space on a DMX uh, inflection. Sharon, can you inject joints if there are, if there are osteophytes? Um, if you're talking about facet joints, yes, we uh, generally inject lots of facet joints that have osteophytes. Just makes it a little harder. Uh, Finn, uh, do you have any experience with doxycycline treatment for CCI? Supposedly inhibits MMPs, can shift the balance of collagen turnover towards growth and repair. Um, uh, we use doxycycline as part of the regenerative injections we do. 
I've never seen it fix anyone's CCI ever. Uh, so I don't think that doxycycline is going to be effective here for someone to try and treat their CCI. Now, if they maybe have some mild arthritis and not CCI in the upper neck joints, it could, it could possibly make their um, arthritic pain in those joints feel better and reduce symptoms that they may associate with CCI, but they don't really have CCI. They've got upper cervical joint issues. Oleg, hypothesis for post-vaccine uh, issue. Someone mentioned having inflammation from reaction. Yeah, Oleg, that would take weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months, to really cause a problem. Um, so that next day isn't really going to fit into that topic. That's more like the use of collagenase. Um, so I, I doubt that, you know, CCI was caused by the next day due to inflammation. Um, if a rheumatoid arthritis type inflammation, in addition, uh, that can erode uh, ligaments up there. That happens over really years. And it looks completely different uh, on MRI. In fact, I just saw one of those patients last week than what it is we see here with classic CCI or with this sort of sub failure CCI that we're talking about. Uh, Rosalind, restoring disc height to a collapsed cervical disc, prosthetic disc, for example, crucial responsibility to the longitudinal ligaments buckle if it's not sorted. Not sure what you mean there, Rosalind. Does that mean that you have a prosthetic disc or that you're, you're gonna get one? I think maybe you're gonna get one or thinking of getting one. You know, the biggest problem with prosthetic discs is that they act like a fusion, meaning you know patients still get adjacent segment disease above and below based on the existing literature. So I don't really see a, an advantage to a prosthetic disc at this point. Kimmy, MRI and X-ray doesn't mention my atlas touching my skull, just the C1 poster arch being too close to the C2. Oh, C1, C, okay, gotcha. The C1 poster arch is there but it's too close to the dens. Um, yeah, Kimmy, so that's that's something we'd look at. Uh, I mean, what you're saying there, and I'd have to see how close it is to the dens, um, is basically that the skull and C1 have shifted dramatically forward. If that's the case, then there, are, there could be bigger issues um, so certainly, um, getting a DMX would be helpful, uh, but you want to make sure that's a safe thing to do because what you're describing at least sounds more ominous than what we first, uh, discussed. Katarina, what are your thoughts on low level light therapy or light therapy to assist with healing after injection, preventing fragile ache and potentially fixing mild ligament laxity? I don't think it'll fix mild ligament laxity, but it I don't think it's going to hurt healing. I doubt it's going to dramatically help healing because light's not going to get into these areas that we're talking about. And I've got to go here in about five minutes because I've got a two o'clock meeting. So I'm just going to take a few more questions here. Finn, if ADI inflection C1 to overhang is all under two millimeters, but C2 rotation occurs left and sometimes right and neutral, is it probably a loose C1, C2 facet? Uh, Finn, I'd need more to answer that question. Um, for instance, uh, how much lateral bending was there with the C1-C2 overhang and what other things are going on? So can't can't give you that diagnosis here. Liam, I'm almost telling me from PSL in December. Definitely noticing failure to get symptomatic improvement the last couple of weeks. Should I wait until my symptom improvement tapers off before consulting for a second PICL? Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Liam. I always like to see people get to their max or close to their max um, before we pull the trigger on another procedure because who knows, maybe your max is mostly better and, and you don't need a second procedure. You know, it's always our hope to do as few procedures as possible. Uh, Katerina, how and where are stem cells harvested on from patients uh, for stem cell procedure? That's from the PSIS area or the back of the pelvis there. And I'm just going to take a few here. 
Ulysses, almost everyone is afraid to get C0 to C2 injected because of the vertebral artery. Um, yeah, that's why you got to go someplace where they've done it thousands of times and have digital subtraction and geography for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, is it rare to hit the vertebral artery under fluoroscopy? Um, well, there's a couple different levels there to consider. The first would be, was it fluoroscopy with contrast? So, for example, we know of a clinic in Florida that doesn't use any contrast. They just stick the needle in there and use the fluoroscopy to try to hit a bony spot. So in that case, you wouldn't have any idea. Uh, the next level up from that would be using fluoroscopy with radiographic contrast. In that case, you might see it go in the artery, but it's very, very fast. So then the third level up would be digital subtraction angiography, where you, where you subtract out the background and you can see it even if it goes very fast in the artery. So that would be the standard to rule out that it's not in the artery, would be fluoroscopy with contrast and digital subtraction angiography. Um, now, most pain management C-arms don't have DSA because it's like a $20,000, $25,000 addition. It's usually only on cardiology machines or the machines that we have because we do injections in this area uh, all day long. Rosalind, your level four injections, is the patient awake for those? And do patients get a choice with whether they get PRP or prolotherapy with that EDS? So if we're doing injections from the back, patients uh, can certainly have a choice. And uh, as far as being awake, generally not. Patients asleep. Uh, let's see. Just trying to take a few here as I go. So I apologize if I'm skipping your questions. Uh, I just have a hard uh, two o'clock and it's past two o'clock. Do you know if we already uh, booked up for PICL before your April uh, vacation? That one I don't know, Stacy. Carla would be the person to reach out to. Uh, run on my cervical DMX, I have 11.6 millimeters left and 8.9 right C1, C2 with rotation. Wouldn't be with rotation, Ron, it would be lateral bending. So um, I would need to know what those numbers are on the overhang of C1, C2 with lateral bending and not rotation. Um, have you ever seen a patient in optic nerve compressed with CCI? Wrong area. So there's no optic nerve close to here. Um, so uh, that would, but there are things with CCI that can cause visual issues. I've got a whole uh, video on that. You may want to go back uh, to. Spinal canal dimensions go down to six millimeters at C4-5 with posterior osteophytes compressing the cord. Um, yeah, so I'd need to see the MRI, but certainly you're sounding like something that could, you're describing something that could need surgery. Uh, neutral 3D cone beam scan, which is the back of my skull is left off the atlas, facets by seven millimeters, give me a low 29 CXA. Uh, with low CXA, usually caused by the posterior ligaments here, PAOM and others. Uh, so it can generally be treated if it's going, uh, if it's increasing in flexion, or I'm sorry, if the CXA is decreasing in flexion. Um, okay, guys, I think I need to get rocking here because I'm four minutes late from a meeting. Uh, I apologize. I didn't get to all the questions there. Also apologize for the snafu uh, in the beginning. I think uh, StreamYard has changed their uh, stuff there a little bit. And I pressed the button I usually press and now it doesn't do what it used to do. So noted on my end. Uh, so thanks so much for, for being here today. Um, if you're interested in getting any kind of consult, Again, don't go through our website or call the call center, either Regenix or Centeno Schultz. Best to reach out to uh, Carla directly. Uh, Carla can help you figure that out. So that's Carla's information there. Uh, so thanks so much. Have a great week. Uh, I think I will be here on Friday. Not quite sure what we'll do on Friday, uh, but I'm sure we'll come up with something uh, interesting. 
So thanks for the great questions and you guys have a great week.